Thanks. I'll be in order of prayer. Dearly Father, we uh, thank you for this day. And Lord, I thank you for your students. I just pray that you to help us. Give me uh, insight as to what to say and what not to say today as we study homogeneous manifolds. Lord, you know, I pray. Amen. All right, so I thought I would follow um, resisting the temptation to look at Neeb's probably more awesome presentation. Um, and I am trying to more or less follow chapter 21 of Introduction to Smooth Manifolds by uh, John and Lee. And I'll read you some foreshadowing comments the start of his chapter. I think it's useful to gain some context here. He's like, okay, in chapter 4 we showed that a surjective smooth submersions play a role in smooth manifolds theory that is strongly parallel to the role of quotient maps in topology. Sorry, Bradley. Um, but the one question we did not address was which quotients of smooth manifolds are themselves smooth manifolds? So when you study topology, you study this notion of quotient, quotient topology, which gives a way of sort of dividing out a piece of the topological space and like squishing it to a point and making a new top new, new topology. It's much like the story. Have you seen the story yet? I don't know. You haven't the had story. You haven't had abstract, right? No, abstract. Nice. So you're taking abstract with me. That's right. I should yeah. remember those things. <laughs> um, hmm. Ah, I forget. I re I read a, a definition of it here. Oh, quotients in linear, but did you take linear with me? No. No. So the likelihood of him sitting quotient space in linear is... Yeah, there is well, no, no quotient space. But I, I read... Uh, ironically, if you were to think about the set of all possible linear algebra classes, you could probably consider it as a quotient. Part <laughs> of the thing that would be in the quotient would be the study of quotient spaces. I read a definition of quotient spaces in the representation theory book, and it ah. was like um, the set of all possible cosets of, a, of an ideal, of a left ideal. Exactly. So that's, that's what it is? Mm hmm So... Okay. Well, that, that's a better definition than I've heard before, for sure. Ah, uh, well, I mean, basically, you can... Th this, cos this coset construction comes up in different parts of math. Um, sometimes additively, sometimes multiplicatively. When we study next semester, we study abstract algebra, we will learn that when we're talking about multiplicative cosets, an additional requirement is needed for the factor group, for the quotient group to form actually an abstract group. We learn that, in fact, the subgroup has to be what's called normal. Only normal subgroups allow a well-defined group operation on the co coset mm -hmm. that's independent of the representative. However, there's another theory in group theory, theorem in group theory, which is that abelian groups, abelian subgroups are normal. So, in other words, if you form the factor group for an abelian subgroup, then it works. The thing about vector spaces is vector spaces are first an additive group. There's a zero, there's an additive inverse, it's associative. So we can always form a factor group in the sense of the quotient space of a vector space. It's like, just easy, because, well, subspaces are abelian because vector addition does is commutes, yeah. so like the quotient space construction in linear algebra is pretty pretty simple, really. The subtlety, of course, is in showing that maps which are defined on cosets are actually well defined. In other words, that they're independent of the representative that's used to define them. That's subtle. <clears throat> Will anyone in linear algebra get that question right on the final the semester? I don't know. We shall see. So that's well defined. Show us well. De yeah, the well defined question. Mm -hmm. If I ask a question about that, can they do it? Show what's well defined. Something. You define a you define a mapping from one quotient space to another by some rule. Typically, you make the definition in terms of a coset, mm -hmm. which is like an element plus a subspace. Right. That's not unique because if you take any other, you know, as long as the difference between your original representative and your next one is in the subspace, it's another representative. Right. So, so like that's the, not unique. Right, no, by no means. Like, you think about the coset as like a plane. Any two points in the plane, any point in the plane can be used to represent it. Yeah. It's far from unique. So if you define the formula for a function in terms of a specific representative, it begs a question, which is, how do you know it doesn't depend on your choice of representative? That's what's usually called well def the question of, is the mapping well-defined? Oh. I digress. Sorry. 
Uh, anyway, so um, he's before talked about quotients, quotient spaces, quotients of manifolds, all right, in this book, in chapter 4. Um, but he has not even addressed the question of when is the quotient itself a smooth manifold. He says, in general, the class of all quotient spaces is far too broad to admit a good theory. But there's one class of quotients, which a lot can be said, he said, um, those that result from smooth Lie group actions. Well, we've studied Lie groups in here a little bit, right? So that's where this ties into what we're doing. Um, but, bad news, there are still many examples of smooth Lie group actions whose quotients are not manifolds. <laughs> so the class of all smooth Lie group actions is still too big. You need to impose additional conditions to make sure you actually get a nice quotient space. In other words, a quotient space which is actually itself a manifold. All right. Um, and then, so that's what this chapter is about in particular, is adding, tacking on conditions to a smooth Lie group action on a manifold that will make the resulting quotient actually itself a manifold. In particular, uh, free. What does it mean for an, a group action to be free? What is a group action, by the way? I guess that's a little bit... I mean, the group is this abstract thing, right, that's mm -hmm. closed under inverses has an identity, is associative. A group action on the set is you take a pair, a group, something in the group, something in the set, and you produce something else in the set. So the group you can think of as acting on the set. You could say g comma s goes to g dot s or something like that. Or you could say g comma p maps to g dot p. Think about p being the point in the set, g being the group element. A um, good example of this, rotations on the plane. So you, your, your set of points is the plane, your group is, say, SO2. So that's a, that's a group action. Now, SO2 is not free. The reason it's not a free action, what's a free action? Free, meaning that the group acts without fixed points. What's a fixed point for SO2 acting on the plane? Would it be the, the identity? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Or zero? Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's probably what you meant. But the origin. Yeah. Right. Added the identity, yeah. I guess. Mm. <coughs> we throw out, but yes, that's the other point, is we throw <laughs> out the identity in the group when we talk about, there's no fixed, there's no fixed points for any non-identity group element. Because, of course, the identity group element, part of it being group action, Part of the definition of group action is, in fact, that the identity element in the group does nothing. Right. So it's like p, p goes to p for all p. That's part of the definition of group action. Indeed, really, really. If you don't mind me using a technical term. Yeah. Hopefully you get all. Okay. So, <clears throat> that's free. Free means that the group acts without fixed points. All right. Um, the second condition is that it be proper. Now, I can't, I'm a little bit annoyed. He uses the word proper in here to define a proper group action. But then when I try to track back where he first says proper in this book, I can't find it. I've looked for about three, four minutes at this point. <laughs> so, sorry, we'll have to like, if, if, if we get more technical into it, it might become an issue. I can't fix it right now. But here's his heuristic explanation for what proper means. He says it means roughly that each compact subset is moved away from itself by most elements of the group. So, in some sense that's saying that the group action actually does something, I guess. <laughs> it's proper. So the main theorem of this chapter is the quotient manifold theorem. It asserts that a Lie group acting smoothly, freely, and properly in a smooth manifold yields a quotient space with a natural smooth manifold structure. Da 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 da. Uh, we study homogeneous spaces which are smooth manifolds endowed with a smooth transitive Lie group action, and we'll show that they're equivalent to Lie groups modulo closed subgroups. Okay. So, just um, first of all, a little bit of terminology. <coughs> What's transitive group action by the way? Um, 
so we've got this set, right? And here's point P, here's point Q, right? If the group action is transitive, that means that there's some I can I can get to it by action you know, like g dot p is equal to q um, you know for each um, oh man I don't want to say this wrong I, I want to say for each p in s there exists g and g and q that's still not it. Still not it. Is that right? Maybe I should say for each p comma q and s. Yeah. Like that exists at g. Uh, there exists a g and g. Yes, Daniel. Could I throw one at the hole? Could you, I told you you can't run in the hole, man. I have a donut. Can you have a donut? Yes, you can eat your donut if you want. Are you sure you want to do that now? Mm -hmm. Okay, because then you can't have it later when they're having them. Ooh, we're having them. Oh, go, uh. Oh, what about the pizza party for, uh, oh. for Vance Calc? It's on Wednesday. Elders. Oh, that's happening still? That's, that's Wednesday. Wednesday. Wednesday, yes. I need to send an email about that. Oh. Wednesday okay. lunch. Advanced Wednesday. Calculus pizza party. Wednesday lunch. I must lunch. publish this more. Yes. Wednesday lunch. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Assuming I can get everybody. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm not. Uh, hopefully no one. I mean, everybody's got to eat lunch, right? <laughs> At some point. Are you going to the appeal appreciation? <laughs> no. You get free stuff. Like what? Like, ah. like, like a shirt. Whoa, like man. a mug. Isn't that cool? Shirt, mug, and food. That I've actually been going to. At least a hug. Yeah, you get a hug too. A hug? I want a hug. Can I give anyone? <laughs> I want the donut to hug me. <laughs> <laughs> like that Krabby Patty episode of Spongebob, like the killer. He like started hallucinating about the Krabby Patty. There's so many episodes of Spongebob, I have not studied them all. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the earlier, like, down track ones. Ah, I but see. Let's see here. So, um, little notation. G, at least this is Lee's notation. G dot p is the orbit of p under g. So this is like g dot p such that g is in g. It's the orbit. Orbit of p under g. It defines an equivalence relation on the set on which the group acts, right? So, all right. Um, just some it's, examples. It's kind of like curse sets, but just like with the group action. Right. Um, I mean, to be more to be more explicit, we're assuming that there's something he could use as a theta. Theta is a mapping from G cross M to M again, where our notation is that theta of g comma p is equal to g dot p, and then this theta is smooth. Is uh is, is s a subset of g? No, or they're just no. not related at all. They they don't have to be related at all. I mean, they're related by theta. <laughs> so they're just two groups then. No, s is not a group. S is a is a set of points on which the group acts. Or according to the the rules and regulations of a group action, some of which I have told you. Um, let's see here. That is on my list of things to do in abstract algebra, though. I do think we should talk about group actions for a week that or two. That would be good. Yes. Quite lost on that in the becoming. Because I think it's something that's good to hear other people talk about rather than just self-study. Um, Anyway, there, there are a couple of axioms that it has to satisfy. I think it has to, I mean, I already told you one, if, we, if G is the identity, mm -hmm. like the identity of the group, 
Yeah. You also need to have like kind of associativity. Ah, right. Yeah. So if you have like g g one g dot h dot p, it's equal to g h dot p. Also, that's that's not. I mean, if you look at it, like you said, it looks like it's just a group, right? Bradley, I mean, you get the yeah. Oh, Daniel, like be careful, man. You okay? Mm -hmm. What you doing? What? Don't attack me! Anymore. <laughs> I warned you about that. I will punish you. Ahem. Do you want something to play with? Mm -hmm. Want turtles? Sure. I got the turtles. Do you want them? What's they, that? They snap. I said those turtles look pretty cool. There you go. Maybe when I find my turtles, we might. Oh, you gonna you can play with them in the hallway? Yes, yeah, so that. Um, okay, just play with them. Play with them right, Daniel. You play right there, okay? okay. No, 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 no. You can play. Oh, right here. That'll work. That's fine. If he starts running, let me know. <laughs> um, You're the watch bud. <laughs> <clears throat> Where was I? So that does look like associativity of a group, right? But, but the, it's but not necessarily on right here. Right. Now you're right. It could actually be just a straight up group multiplication. I mean, there's an example of this. You can look at the group action of the group multiplying on itself. You can take the case that G is equal to S. That's a special case. It's kind of boring. Kind of, kind of boring, but also kind of important. I think studying that leads to the CELO theorems and other things. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so some, exa um, some examples, of course. Um, <laughs> so I'll run through his list of examples. Of group orbits, real quick. Um, a, if you just say g dot p equals to p for all of g and g, and each p in the manifold. Notice I didn't say which manifold, and I didn't say which group. Um, this gives you a stupid. <laughs> In this case, the um, the space of okay, so um, this is an orbit, right? But if you think of the orbits themselves as points, right? If you identify all the points, like this um, here, this this whole thing, all right, um, it would be an orbit, all right. So you could think of this this whatever that is. Um, P is equivalent to Q, you could think of all of that as like a single point, the equivalent of class P. And then you could look at all such, all such things that would be what you would might denote by, how's he denote it? Um, I'm kind of keep and mod G, something like that. Kind of I mean, I might use like this. This S is equal to M. Sorry. First of all, that's probably the confusion. So, like, what? I'm I'm confused as to what G dot P is actually doing, because it's like it's G the group acting on a point P in some set S. In some some manifold. Some M, some yeah. manifold but, yeah. M. And what does it do to the point? Depends. It depends on the example. Just does whatever. It takes it to. It usually takes it to a different point in some sort of geometrically meaningful way. These examples will help clear up your question. This one, not so much. This one's stupid. Um, here, this just says that P is equivalent to P for all P and M. Like, the, the orbits are points. So, you're identifying a point with itself. So, in this case, this is just M again, which is just very silly, as he says. He actually says it is the orbit space is is equal to m. And it's smooth. It's a smooth manifold for silly reasons. He literally says that in here. It's for silly reasons. Yes. Okay. The simplest non-trivial example to keep in mind. He says 
is the action of RK on RK cross RM. So this one will be a little better. Um, so G equals to RK, which is, by the way, group under addition, just to be clear, um, on RK Cartesian product RM. Um, and so here's the deal. For V in RK, so this V is like the G in our previous lingo. Here's the deal. V dot the pair x comma y is equal to v plus x comma y. Yeah, I, I told you the students called this red square. It made her very happy. <laughs> Wait, what? Well, the students call this general area a red square because of my Russian neighbors. Oh, it's really? or my neighbors who love Russia. They're, They're all Russian? Well, she's got a picture of Vladimir. No, uh, Stalin. <laughs> oh, she's got a picture of Stalin in her office. <laughs> it sounds and, like. And she's got various Russian garb over there. I don't know. Oh, man. It sounds like my. Uh, I had a choir teacher in high school who had, like, the. Uh, he had the Book of Marx, like, in his office and, like, read things. And he would, like, read. We would, like, catch him in his office just reading Marx every now and then. And he was like very strong and he had like the sort of Hitler stash and he had like that kind of ruddy face. And <laughs> he was, he's literally a communist. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's special. He could play the fiddle really well as well. And my brother had a friend who uh, had the Book of Mormon prominently displayed on his uh, bunk bed at Bob Jones. <laughs> That's mostly just to, uh, mostly just for the shock value of it. <laughs> Not actually a Mormon. But, um. No! No, 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 no. No, that is not a rolling toy, man. Don't do that. You're going to break it. Are you done with it? All right, I'll take it back then. That doesn't come apart. That doesn't come apart. It's just, no, it does not. It stays like that. It stays like that. You can just put that back in there. Thank you. Does it fit? Whoa, cool. Now you can put the back in it. Alright. I'll take it back. Do not run. Come back in here. Sit under the desk, please. Thank you. scribblings from women with looking at this book. All right. <clears throat> so, this defines a group action. What are the orbits? Uh, so if you, like, take, say, G dot a particular, say, X naught, or Y naught, what's that look like? Like a isomorphic to yeah R K that's centered at x one x not y not right right it's basically just this this space right it's in a fine it's in a it's a it's a k dimensional subspace that has in it the point so if you wanted to draw a picture of this. So here's like RK, P plus RK, basically. So down here would be like RK. RK, you know. Just the regular one. And then this direction would be the, the RN. There's a picture of it. And then you've just got a stack of these K dimensional planes that fills out, so you know, the total space, which is RN cross RK. So G acting on a point, G 
just brings the field RK up to where that point is, essentially. Is that what we're... Yeah, G acting on a point just moves you horizontally, basically. I mean, it will... Oh, so, so the V right. is the action of G, right? Yeah. And then, so what is the big G dot? X not. Oh, not this is just the is notation for the whole orbit. These for all possible. G is for all of them. Yeah, this so is for all, all the whole the whole kit and caboodle. All possible actions of G on right. Right. the point. So, so B would like be that arrow, and G would be the whole uh, affine space. Yeah. Okay. So there's an example. It's nice when they talk about group actions and you give examples. Of course. Um, so in fact, if you look at this mod RK, in fact, it's pretty obvious that we get Rn. In other words, the orbit space, if you want to label orbits, right? If you want to parameterize the orbits, well, what's a coordinate on the orbit? So what I mean this so you know I, I want to look at here's a typical so I'm looking like here's I want to define psi on say um, x naught comma y naught um, plus goodness gracious this notation is obnoxious what would the coordinate what would a natural coordinate map on this be? How can I represent this orbit? Just like RK. I'm not sure if I understand what you're asking. I'm asking, I'm, I'm telling you that if you think of these cosets as points, mm -hmm. and you look at the collection of all of those, you form mm -hmm. something, you form a new space. I was just gonna like our set of space. orbits. Okay. I'm claiming that that set of orbits is diffeomorphic to Rn. Mm -hmm. I'm asking you, what's the coordinate map? Yeah, so it's just gonna go to why not? Exactly, exactly, just why not. And so if you think about it, it's pretty obvious that if you just take a particular I mean, you can, there's a lot of different choices, but one natural choice would just be like this point or this point, which is exactly, you know, I mean, what is that? That's it's like why not zero. Right. Or zero, why not? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. Now, there's no reason for, like, if you just keep thinking about different group actions, that this kind of labeling <coughs> of orbits has to be done in a smooth way. The example is he's about to give us, give you example of orbit spaces which are not manifolds, but they're kind of almost manifolds. <coughs> Excuse me. So, oh man, we're So he says you can look at the circle, the circle group on the plane. He calls it S one. He's got like he's got like a black man. He's got a double blackboard S. It's like that. The double S. This is one of the letters I can't. Mm. Right. I'm not very good at reproducing. Double S. Yeah, it's the same way you do like R. It, oh it, yeah, that's, that's it, see like that. Yeah, I, I'm not very good at that. It's kind of like this. Ah, like I said, I'm not very good. Well, you, 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 just, you just connect the two um, undefined slopes with different. I'm trying again. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, that's still not. It's not. I'm just making it big. <laughs> that's Dumb. a double letter. I gave up. Anyway, so this thing. 
um, on R2, which you identify with the complex numbers, and the mapping is just so Z comma W goes to ZW for all Z and S1, where this is just what? Modulus Z equals to 1. So the unit modulus numbers multiply the other complex numbers and I mean this is just a slick notation for rotations, right? <coughs> so the orbits in this case, if you take a point, right, and you look at its orbit, right, this is P dot S, right? <clears throat> so Z is the group action here. What's that again? Is Z the group action here? Z, Z. Right. Z is the group element, yeah. Group element, yeah. S one is that S one yeah, the group the unit circle of the complex number the unit circle of the complex numbers is is it is itself a group called S1? So right. Like S1 is equal to G. Yeah. It's the unit modular. So I mean, basically, S1. You could write it this way. It's e to the i theta, right? If you like, you could write it that way. <coughs> and so you know what happens. I mean, this explicitly is what it's like e to the i theta times modulus of, of, of W, e to the i beta, which is modulus of W, e to the i, beta plus beta. So it just takes base, I mean, geometrically, beta maps to theta, beta plus theta. It's a translation and angle. It's a, it's just, it's just, rotation. It is a rotation, yeah. And so the orbits are circles, except when they're not. <laughs> We were talking about this one a little bit earlier. Yeah, zero is fixed. This action is not free. But the orbits are usually circles. The orbit space, though. Okay, so if you want to make the complex uh, plane, or R2 if you like, mod, um, if you want to look at the space of orbits as its own, as its own thing, right, then what but what I think about doing, we should all think about doing, is drawing some kind of cross section, which is some kind of thing which cuts through each orbit one only one time. That's sometimes possible. And so if you do that, then it usually tells you what the what the coordinate should be. So here the coordinate on the orbit mm -hmm. should just be the what. Yeah, if I if I wanted to be explicit here, the coordinate on um, you know g dot w, which is be equal to the modulus of w, right? Which is an element of zero to infinity, which is why it's not a manifold because of this. The zero is included the trouble it's not a that spoils it if you look at it more carefully if you want to make it the orbit space into a manifold you just delete the uh, delete the uh, the origin if you look at the puncture plane with rotations acting on it then you, you do get in fact a manifold for the orbit space which is just the reals again is, um, is W just any point in R2 So this, this, if we delete the origin, then we do get this. Right. <coughs> so, wait, would it be R plus? Or? Ah, yeah, 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 sorry. Of course, <laughs> as you know,
right? So, I mean, double logic lately. All right, so, um, and I think also diffeomorphically. Yeah. All right, so, where was I? Ahem. Example D. About to try to write with the uh, hmm. yeah, worse the other end of the marker. <laughs> that would not work. Um, you can look at G equal to GLN acting on RN. So basically, there you're taking something like A, comma X and you're just mapping it to the natural thing, AX. Um, so what are the... What are the two... <coughs> there are, he says there are two orbits. And so that it, it then means that the, the quotient topology, which I won't belabor in here because I know Bradley doesn't hasn't suffered the things you suffered, but um, the quotient topology, the thing, the the open subsets in the quotient topology from this are the empty set and the whole set and the singleton, um, a particular singleton. The orbit space is not even Hausdorff, let alone manifold. Okay, so what are the two orbits then? That Let, let's focus on what we can't understand in here, which is the orbits. What are the orbits? I'll, I'll do the easy one. If you look at um, zero, just the origin dot g. Well, it's right. If you multiply a matrix times zero, you get back zero. Does, does, does zero to matter when you say like zero dot g or g dot yeah, zero? Did I switch it up? I think, so. I think it should be g dot zero. Oh, I'm sorry. Because so, g is the matrix, right? Oh, oh and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Zero, it's zero it's vector. Uh, I, am, I, am trying, I am trying to be um, uniform in my notation, so yeah, thank you. You can look at left and, there are left actions and there are right actions. And sometimes it's important to distinguish between what you're using. There's an interplay between both of them that comes up. Um, I guess if the group is commutative, then it doesn't matter. Yeah. I mean, it's a question of formalism. I mean, if you set up, for example, principal fiber bundles, deeper geometric things, you can set them up in terms of like left actions. You get certain transformation rules and certain rules and conventions for things, whereas if you'd started with a right action, it would have been different. And it's important to be aware of this because certain parts of the literature base everything off left actions, whereas other parts of the literature base things off right actions. And so being aware of these quirks is important if you want to like kind of understand what a given person's writing. But that's further down the road. I'm just saying it doesn't matter. Um, but not too much to us, really. So that that's that. Now think about this. So here's Rn, right? Here's two points, P and Q. Can you connect these? Does there exist an invertible matrix that will take you from one to the other? Well, I mean, GLN is connected. So. I guess what I'm really asking is, can I solve AP equals to Q <coughs> for some A? But I get to work with arbitrary A is the thing. Mm -hmm. But they're all invertible, right? Yeah, invertible matrices, that's true. So just multiply both sides by the, by the inverse? 
Yes, this is also the same as looking for a oh. inverse times q equals to p oh, that for arbitrary help. p and q. That's true. Now, hmm. I guess we could look at it this a different way. Suppose you're looking at a a p equals to q, um, where this is where this is like free, and this is given, and you can make this whatever in GLN if you look at it from that perspective. Can you reach any p in this way? I mean, any, can you reach any q in this way? I mean, there's so much freedom here. I don't think you've ever seen a problem like this in linear per se. Mm -hmm. We usually work with a lot less data. And Q can't be zero either, right? I mean, yeah, I think that's. Well, I guess, no, I guess it could be. I think it could be zero. Right? Well, so, so we're given a P and we're trying to. A make can't it. be zero, though. A is in GLN, it's an invertible right. matrix. But I guess you could. But Q could be zero, I suppose. Hmm. Is it possible? No, that's impossible. Yeah. It's impossible because a times zero is zero. If a times p was also equal to zero, and if it like row times the first one, that would be that like would all be, the rows have. Well, that all would, the rows would have to be like combinations of each other. Something like that. But I mean, I just you'd have two solutions to the homogeneous problem, which then says a is not invertible. So you can't you can't produce Q being zero unless P is zero. By okay. basic properties of invertible matrices, yeah. So we're saying given some point P we can find some A to get any Q we want. Is that the mm -hmm. <coughs> What he's he talks about in there is he's a little bit more like precise. He's just kind of takes some of the ambiguity out. He's like I think he's like, suppose Q is equal to E one. Or, okay, let's be more specific, suppose P is given, suppose P is equal to E1. Right? So you're looking at something times 1, 0, 0 yeah. is equal to Q. <clears throat> Could we maybe prove that there exists uh, a path to every other um, unit? Or not out? Oh, I think you're thinking too hard, but yeah. The first column has to be Q. The first column is Q? Yeah. It's like complicated. And now here, um, we're of course assuming that, well, I mean, I would say you're using Q with, um, I guess you don't, I mean, uh, th then you just make these zero, right? It doesn't have to be well, good. That, well, that, that will definitely give you Q. Oh, you're right. It doesn't matter what you put here. Just something in GL n minus one, right? Well, oh, there's n. Uh, what about the top column? Yeah, plus or the top row. The top row has to be zeros, right? What's that? It doesn't have to be zero, so it doesn't. No, it doesn't have to. So otherwise, what you Good. pick up. The point is that this matrix has to be invertible, right? It has to be in GLN altogether. So how you fill out the rest of it, I guess, is your business. But certainly if we put Q here, we can choose linearly independent columns to fill out the rest, right? Mm -hmm. As long as the columns are linearly independent, right. it's invertible. Mm -hmm. And it produces Q again. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, if it's not E1 to start with, you can you can find a matrix that will change your given p to e1. Okay. Right. I mean, you can take mm. yeah. you can solve m times p equals to e1. You just do, you know, I mean, that you can find a matrix to do that. I think. Yeah. For any given p. Okay. I don't know if I'm completely convincing, but. 
you can in fact right. we have so much freedom here you can in fact connect any given point B to any given point Q by some invertible matrix multiplication yeah. mm -hmm. and I think I've started to show you how you would make that explicit I haven't completed the thought there are exceptional <laughs> cases blah 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 something like combining like a uh, rotation in Rn with like a dilation <sighs> Yeah, if we knew the decomposition of, so you're thinking, oh, 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 yeah, um, hmm, use something like the transitivity of uh, SO3 on the unit sphere, I mean, that's kind of an idea, right, you could like, like take this, strike it down to there, strike this, shrink it down to here, yeah, exactly. And then there's some kind of like rotation that goes from there to there. Right. So. Yeah, you could. I suppose you could play that game. Does this, that this work in higher dimensions? Yeah. Oh, I was thinking three dimensionally, wasn't I? Yeah. I was. I. That's a good question. Can we always take points at R n, and like, non-zero points, right? And either project them, squish them down to the unit sphere, the set of unit vectors of unit length in, in Rn, or, or expand it out. And then is it always the case that any two points on the unit sphere in Rn, Sn minus 1, I suppose it is, can you always connect two points on the unit sphere in, in Rn by some multiplication of the. Is there a rotation? Is there an SON element that goes from one point to another? I'm not sure about the first one. I tend to <coughs> think so. Hmm. Interesting question. Oh, anyway, so getting setting aside the points here, let's getting back. To, let me just get back on. Get back to the. I mean that that is a an interesting question. Should think on the. Okay. Um, so if it's true, then like the orbits would just be the entire would just be R n for everything besides zero. Exactly. Yeah, that's it. So like <laughs> g, g dot p for p not equal to zero is exactly R n minus zero. <laughs> that's, that's it. There are two orbits. It's either zero or everything's connected. Daniel. Don't mess with that, please. Thank you. Hmm? Other than <laughs> see, Daniel, you're making still, making still other Daniel worried that I was, I was I was speaking harshly to him. Would you like something else to play with? Mm -hmm. Would you like the Melonium Falcon? Mm -hmm. Would you like the Millennium Falcon? No. Um, you want the ant? What? You want the ant? No, I like the spider. Oh, you want the spider? Okay. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah, so the orbits are kind of like, yeah. <laughs> so orbit space is like a two-point set. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean... There is a sense in which finite sets can be. Ahem. Is it stop? Is that the iPad? Yes. Oh, I'll stop that. Alright, I guess I stopped it. You okay? So, uh, you can restrict this. This this is example D. Example E basically is to restrict to O n. So again, we have let's say R x maps to R x where R transpose R is equal to the identity. So, not, not all of GLN, but just the orthogonal matrices, all right? 
that defines a smooth left action of ON on our end. And in this case, the orbits are what? Zero, but then like the spheres. Yeah. yeah. And so if you believe that, then the answer to your question is affirmative. Yeah. He actually has a little argument here as to why that's possible. He says, um, if you have two vectors V and V prime, normalize them. And then let A and A prime be the orthogonal matrices whose columns are these orthonormal bases. Uh, oh, complete, because there, sorry. You take the two points. Oh, it's a kind of greedy argument. Daniel? Sit, sit down, please. Thank you. And don't bump the camera, if you could. Thank you. Thank you. So it's very greedy. You take those two points we have pictured. Yeah, it was, this is really, really, I love this argument. It's kind of funny that you were asking the question you were because it actually leads into this discussion. I, and I had just read this like an hour ago and it just slipped my mind. Because I'm an idiot. But anyway, so like that. So V prime, let's say. So these, these points would be V prime divided by the length of V prime. And this point here would be, you know, V divided by the length of V. And what he says, he says, okay, so just take this and extend this to beta. And take this and extend it to beta prime. Both of these guys orthonormal. Of course we can do this because we know Gram-Schmidt algorithm. And we know about completing bases, right? And then he says, okay, so then just look at the mess here. To beta. Hmm? Extend it to a basis, an orthonormal basis. Just yeah. Okay. With the, okay. yeah, with, with, with that being element. its first element, perhaps, yeah. And um, then it's, he yeah. says it's easy to check that. Um, just a second, Dan. Um, and then, you know, let A equal the this one and A prime equal the basis matrix for that one, you know, in the usual way. And then he says you can check the A prime A inverse maps um, V to V prime. Well, um, I think he's really saying it maps this to that. But if you can do that, then you can follow it by the dilations. That's a very non-geometric and just purely algebraic argument. I like it a lot. Yes? Where did you put your Lego, Lego calendar? My Lego calendar? Um, hmm, that is a good question, Daniel. Oh, it's up here. I'm sorry, I'll have to ask one of the, sh the taller people here to get it for you. <laughs> Anything. Yeah, that's fine. I think the next question is, where are the extra pieces? Poor spider, it's seen better days. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, um, I'm not sure what that was. I think... No, not that one. So, huh. I thought that I, oh well, somewhere I've got the extra days. I have already grabbed one. Oh, you got it? He had a box. Oh, where'd you find that box, Daniel? Ah, uh, okay, okay. Where was I? Okay, so we have solved the mystery of connecting the points by the rotation. Well, at least we've sketched it. Um, anyway, getting back to this, what are the orbits with this group action? So it's like for just the spheres. And then yeah, the blank, you know, month that would like to be. Right, so if we, yeah, if we look at on dot p 
we're basically looking at the sphere of radius P, right, centered at zero. If that makes sense. They're spheres of radius because the orthogonal transformation doesn't change the length from the origin, it just keeps it the same distance from the origin. And as you go through all possible rotations, you'll just connect all possible points of that particular radius. So, yeah, spheres upon spheres. Again, um, not, not going to be a... Um, the orbit space is not going to be... If you, if you look at... Um, let's see here. If you look at Rn, mod on, again you get that as the orbit space. And if you delete the origin, then you get zero to infinity. Um, let's see here. You can also look at the, you can also look at, F is actually deleting the origins from the last three examples in his book. Um, you can look at on, N, N minus 1 to SN minus 1, which would be the mapping what, um, you know, R comma P maps to RP again. That makes sense because if this has length 1 from the origin, it's, I mean, it's still on SN minus 1. And, um, This action is transitive. Ah, so what does transitive mean, actually? space is a point. There's just one orbit. There you go. That's how we should characterize transitive. There's just one orbit. Okay. All right. There's a little bit more. Um, I mean, there's several sections in the book I'm skipping over. The uh, quotient, the um, quotient manifold theorem, and it's a section on covering spaces, which is nice. And then homogeneous spaces, finally, is what I wanted to talk about. And so here's basically the big theorem. Um, mm, oh, yeah. Here's the theorem. Let G be a Lie group and H a closed subgroup. subgroup H, all right? The left coset space G mod H is a topological manifold Dimension, dimension G minus dimension H, um, and has a unique smooth structure smooth structure da -da 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 -da, such that the quotient map pi from g to g mod h 